Right, okay, so this does not turn on. There's an uh, issue with the power button, it pushes in further than it should, but I don't think that's an issue. Or at least I don't think that's the main issue, but it's not turning on. It's been sent in by a customer, obviously. So let's have a look and see what the deal is with it. It looks like it's been taken apart before, which is unsurprising. Because everyone seems to think I want their prior repair attempts. Hopefully it's not had anything stupid done to it. Right, so the Nexus connector looks fine. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Nexus connector is basically the power connector. Or the, the connector that connects the power button up. So that's fine, or it looks fine anyway. Not a lot of dust inside here. The one thing I do like about the Xbox is they don't seem to get as much dust as the PlayStations do. For whatever reason. This video probably still would have been here without today's sponsor. But hey, it's time to show something, right? So here goes. Here at the Code of Productions, we love nothing more than to take as much money from you, the viewer, as we possibly can. Which is why we're proud to talk to you about ConsoleFix.shop. A great place for you to spend your hard-earned cash. I mean, yeah, fair enough. You get parts and supplies that help you fix things, but you've got to give me some money in return. Nothing in life's free, and if you pay me for it, you might appreciate it more. Or not. Hey, I'm not judging. With that being said, we do have some pretty cool stuff on the shelves, including power supplies, HDMI ports, charging chips, MOSFETs, and whatever else you can think of that'll give you the illusion that you're getting a good deal. So head on over to the online store by clicking on the link in the video description and if there's one thing I can guarantee is that there will be a way for me to take your money. Console Fix, your friendly money grabbing YouTuber. Right, okay, so here we go then. First thing I always do, well, once I've actually removed every screw instead of leaving one by accident, uh, first thing I always do with these, we know power is test the 12 volt phase, uh, the 12 volt uh, output on the power supply. Let's make sure the power supply is actually outputting 12 volts. First thing you should always do is test the power supply. Never just assume it's a board issue just because it's not working or just because it's not turning on. So, I'll put one probe in that side, one probe on the other row. DC voltage mode and we get 11.75 volts which is about right with the voltage drop and stuff that's about right so that side of the power supply is working or rather that 12 volt supply is working but there are two on this and yep exactly the same on that one chances are if this one's working this one's going to be working um, I think they both come off the same thing uh, basically, one's to power the safe bridge board and one's to power the APU board because of the sandwich design of it. So that means we've probably got an issue with the 12 volt side on the motherboard. It could be it could be safe bridge board related. So it could be related to this board here. Um, but what I will check is in continuity mode. I'll just check the 12 volt side. On the board itself, on the main board. And there is no short. So, what's my resistance? Uh, I'll tell you what, let's take the board out. Let's just get to this board quickly. It doesn't appear as though there's a short on this board. Right, so we get a diode reading of. Well, one volt and increase it. Well, it might help if I actually had the probes the right way around. Red probe on ground, Phil. Come on, you know better than that. Ignore the beeping. Uh, actually, you know what? Shut up, multimeter. We get 0.4 volt drop to ground in diode mode. That's about right. It's not a perfect reading, but that's about right. So I've got a feeling this could be on the safe bridge board not on the main board so let's just have a look on there right we don't have a short on 12 volt there i am wondering now is this uh, is this actually a nexus ribbon issue what i'll do is i'll grab another safe bridge board and just try it but at the same time i'm also going to grab a nexus ribbon as well right so i've got a spare button board here 
let's just uh one and two just mark it so i don't get mixed up so I'll just put a, a number two on that just so i know that this board belongs with this uh safe bridge board because they are paired so um what i can do well first of all i've done that just so i don't get mixed up and end up screwing the customer's console up by losing his safe bridge board in my pile um obviously i mean it wouldn't be the end of the world i'd find it eventually but i don't want to I don't want to take that chance, so I'll just mark it. It's not an issue. It's not going to hurt the console in any way. So what I'll do then is just try it with my own button board, just to rule that out. So that's all I need for testing. Nothing. Okay, so the next step for me is to check whether it's the APU board that's faulty or the Southbridge board. I know I just said that they're paired, but having a mismatched safe bridge board, all that's going to cause is beep on beep off. We've got no pair at all. So if this turns on with my safe bridge board, then I know we've got an issue with this board. If it doesn't turn on with my safe bridge board, then I know we've got an issue with this board. So, yeah, that's why I do that. So if this does turn on now, it will be a beep on beep off. It'll turn on and turn straight back off because the safe bridge board is mismatched. Uh, worst case scenario, if I can't figure out the issue on this and it is the safe bridge board, I can remarry a new safe bridge board to this console by swapping one chip over. Thanks to Steve B for figuring that one out. But there is a chip that we can swap, swap to remarry the safe bridge board. It's like a little no flash on and it'll repair it with the matching security key. We can reprogram it as well, but you know, we can reprogram the uh, the chip that's on here, but it's easy just to change the chip. But they are fragile to heat as well, so reprogramming might be a better option. Let's have a look. No, okay, so, oh, yes. Right, so we do get power on that board. Took a little while though, that was a bit strange. Let me just double confirm with my uh, with the customer's original board and just make sure. Let me just make absolutely certain that it's not just delaying it in any way. Obviously this board right now cannot be used, right? Because it's paired to another console. But I would rather fix this board because it's cheaper than replacing the board. If I replace the board, the board alone is going to cost the customer £60 just to buy the board. Right, they're not cheap. Uh, having a working, like buying a working Southbridge board isn't going to be cheap. In fact, no, it's more than £60. It's £60 for a donor board. For a working board, you're looking £100 just to buy it. So you'd be looking at like a £140, £150 repair in total. So you don't want to be doing that. I'd much rather figure out the exact issue on this board. Plus, I like to challenge myself, so I would rather figure it out anyway. I don't like to take the easy way out. Not unless it's a last resort. I'll take the easy way out, but only if I can't figure out the issue. Yeah, nothing. Absolutely stone dead with the customer's board. Okay, right, so this is completely dead. I know it's a Southbridge board because I've, I've isolated that. That's the entire point of having a working Southbridge board on hand, available, to be able to confirm that. Because even if it causes a two-second blue light of death, it, uh, sorry, not two-second blue light of death, a beep on beep off, thinking of PS5s again, you know, it still confirms where the fault lies. It still isolates that fault because of the sandwich design of the Xbox series. Um... So it just allows for a much quicker fault finding process. You know, I don't have to sit there fault finding the APU board because I know the fault is on the Southbridge board. So what I can do now is just run through some voltage rails and stuff like that on the Southbridge board and try and figure out the issue based on that. All right, so the good thing about this particular board 
is this is a V1 board. And the V1 boards have got the markings on them, which tells us where everything is. So like here, for example, 3P3FTDI, it's marked. Whereas on the V2 boards, they're not marked. I don't think it's to do with the Nexus connector. I'm going to check inside there because this has been opened. So I'm going to check inside the connector and make sure we've got no damage, just to rule that out. And nope, that looks absolutely fine. Don't see an issue there at all. So assuming my pins are okay, which they do look okay, but I'll double check them. Assuming the pins are okay, I don't think it's going to be related to the Nexus connector. Just because it's had pro repair attempts, if it had never been opened, I'll say pro repair attempt, it's been opened. If it had never been opened, I would never even look into that at all. But because it's been opened, I have to. I have to at least check it. Right. I am going to give it a visual inspection. By the way, that chip I was talking about, the one that's paired to the APU board, that's it. That chip right there, but it is incredibly sensitive to heat. Just saying. Rule number one with any repair, though, is visually inspect your board first. This is a common failure point on this particular circuit, the U40, on this particular board, and these ncp 186s as well. They fail quite often. But rule number one is always visually inspect the board first because... It can save you a lot of time sometimes if you see something like a burnt component or something like that. It can save you a ton of time in fault binding. So a couple of minutes just to give it a visual inspection. That's all you need to do. And the reason that we call it a safe bridge board is because the safe bridge is on the back right there. Hey, WC. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate that. Thank you for the kindness as always, but I genuinely do appreciate it. Right, so I'm not seeing any any blown components or anything on this board. So the next step is going to be to just check some of my test points, some of my voltage rails. I'll have a look at those in diode mode and just see if we've got any shorty rails so for example the 3.3 volt the 5 volt that sort of stuff just make sure we've got no shorted rails on this safe bridge board and i'll run through the test points in diode mode so step number one is going to be to clamp my positive lead to ground red probe on ground for diode mode as always i'll read out the readings 3p3 ftdi that's open line i don't know if that's normal but while it's turned off I don't think it is, but that's open line. I don't think that's normal. So we might have a blown 3.3 volt. 5 volt. He's dead short. Oh, okay. 5 volt, he's dead short. That's why this isn't turning on. So if I go into continuity mode, we're dead short on 5 volt. Dead short on 5 volt. And that, comes from this chip here thank you redis i appreciate that mate right that comes from this chip here the 5 volt uh u26 so it could be that but 5 volt also goes to the south bridge as well so it could be that the best way to do this would be to inject one volt into it and just see what gets hot i think that's what i'm going to do so if i just solder a wire to this I'll just tin that, solder a wire, doesn't have to be a great connection, but as long as it's connected, so if I just set my bench power supply at 1 volt, we get a whopping 5 amps of current draw there, so that should be getting, that something should be getting hot there. It is not that chip
I haven't got my thermal camera to hand. Something should be getting warm there, though. I think it's a safe bridge. No, it's not. I thought I felt heat from the safe bridge, but I'm, I can't. Right, where's getting warm? Oh, haha! <laughs> there, there you are, you little bastard. Felt that somewhere here. There. Right there, there you are. I can see ya. I didn't spot that before. This is why visual inspection is important. That's going to be the cause right there, C306. If I just grab a little bit more IPA. Yep, C306 it is. C306 it is. So now I'm actually looking at it, you can see the burn mark in it. Unfortunately I didn't see that until now. So now if I flip the board around now and test this area, I'll just desolder this wire. Beep. And of course splatter solder all over the freaking board. <laughs> Whoops. I'm just clean that up. That wasn't meant to happen, was it? Cleaning up that pad wasn't absolutely necessary, but whatever. Uh, so now if we test this circuit now, this 5 volt rail. So, we have connection to ground. No short. No short. So that's why I didn't just willingly take this off. Because even though it looks like this chip would be the culprit. Because this is where that circuit's going. If you follow this. like It goes through this chip and it goes up to here. But the wire's just there. And they go through to another layer on the board. And that obviously, based on what we've just found, ends up there on C306. So, if we test that now, we won't be short there either. Good. And we are still connected to ground. But we're not short there. Okay. Yeah, the console would work fine without it, but exactly as you were just saying about using the same as the manufacturer, you know, the designer. If you can replace it, if you've got the option to replace it, replace it. So these are just going to be uh, bypass caps, like these. The console would run absolutely fine without a couple of these in place. But if you've got the ability to replace it, replace it. If you don't have one, not a problem, it will work absolutely fine without that cap. It's just uh, the best thing to do. Like, like Retro just said, it's good practice. Uh, if you've got the ability to replace it, replace it, but if not, it is just a bypass cap. It's not an issue. It's going to work absolutely fine. I could pull five or six caps off this line and it would still work. Just wouldn't be recommended to do that. The caps are there for a reason. There are nine twenty-two microfarad six point three volt caps on that line. Yeah, exactly. So three or four of those missing wouldn't really hurt it. But yeah, there we go. That should technically be working. Let's find out. Okay, moment of truth. This is a customer's safe bridge board. So, if this works now, it should stay on. Boom. Winner, winner. That stays on, it turns on, it works. Happy freaking days. And there's your display. Yeah, buddy. That's a fairly easy and straightforward way of figuring it out. It's always handy to have a working uh, safe bridge board on hand, just to be able to isolate where the fault lies. If it turns on 
and then shuts back down, you know that your fault is on the safe bridge board. It just makes it so much simpler to actually figure out. So yeah, always handy to have a working safe bridge board. But the thing is, if you do need to do a safe bridge board swap, you can do by swapping that one chip. But obviously that's a lot more expensive. If I'd have just taken the easy route on this and just swapped the safe bridge board, which I could have done, instead of sitting there and trying to figure it out, it would have cost the customer twice as much. Because obviously a working safe bridge board ain't cheap. Um, I've got about four or five on hand, so if anyone does need one, I can supply a couple. Yeah, it's as simple as isolating where the issue lies and then testing your voltage rails a lot of the time when you've got no power. If it's a beep on beep off, a beep on beep off, even though it's got power, it's a lot more difficult to diagnose than a complete no power. Because a complete no power, you've got usually got a primary rail fault. So, for example, you've usually got an issue with your 12 volt rail, your 5 volt, your 3.3. Your 1.1, your 1.8, they're generally not going to cause a complete no power unless they're dead short to ground. Um, because it's able to turn on without the 1.1 and the 1.8. They're needed once it turns on as a general rule. So they're used for, for example, supplying power to the APU and the RAM and a few other components. Whereas the main 5 volt rail, so for example, the main 12 volt rail feeds the 5 volt rail, the 5 volt rail feeds the 3.3 volt rail, and the 3.3 volt rail is what's needed to actually detect a button press. So there's a 3.3 volt rail which gets pulled down to ground when you press the button. So if you've got no 12 volt, you've got no 5 volt. If you've got no 5 volt, you've got no 3.3 volt. You have to go down in a, pro in a line sort of thing. So, yeah. There we go. So the 5 volt short was causing the 3.3 volt to be missing, which was obviously stopping it from turning on because it couldn't detect the power button press. Simple stuff. It's really easy.